Welcome everyone to our Feminists Yearning, Imagining and Organizing for Just Peace and Genuine Security. Thank you for being with us. Um, before we begin our program, we acknowledge the lives taken by Corona pandemic, by state violence, by violence rooted in the intersections of misogyny, racism, classism, transphobia, among other forms of oppression. Uh, we, we're with you all um, in ethical solidarity with the struggle for Black lives, with struggles against colonialism and imperialism everywhere. So we say this is not a moment for silence, but instead a time to pause, to let this extraordinary moment enter our room. We also acknowledge the original people of the land, wherever we are. And in some places, the, their land, the original people's land was stolen, colonized, and everything of value extracted, including human beings, natural resources, and sacred objects. We invite our ancestors, our spiritual guides, our comrades, friends, and family also to enter our space because we believe that they'll guide us through our gathering today. And we thank the organizers, of course, of the 7th uh, South-South Forum on Sustainability and uh, the Global University for Sustainability and especially Lingnan University uh, for hosting the two days. They provided the infrastructure uh, that makes it possible for us to be here. Uh, we also thank the interpreters, of course, without whom we would not be able to communicate, uh, especially over Zoom. No, not much body language. Um, and uh, special uh, thanks also to uh, Kim Chi Lao and um, Lai Sang. Can you just say hi to everybody? Right. Um, for their devotion to our Two, uh, two days of uh, being together and for it inviting us in the first place. So thank you very much. Um, our organization, Peace Women Across the Globe, was invited by uh, Professor Ken Chi Lao. And um, what I want to do now is have uh, Ruth Gabi Vermont tell the story of Peace Women Across the Globe. And as the founder of our uh, organization, uh, we, she wants to welcome us. So, Gabi, please. Thank you, Marco. Dear women, dear participants, thank you very much for your contribution to a fundamentally better world. I think it is like this. Uh, to a better understanding and the constant discussions between North and South. East and West, I think so, is also important. This is an important and precious contribution to peace, to understanding and solidarity. I'm the co-president of Peace Women Across the Globe, together with Kamla Basin from India. In the early 2000s, 20 coordinators worldwide and a small office in Switzerland nominated 1,000 peace women. They should receive the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. We all won, wanted to make women from all parts of the world visible for the important and relevant peace work of every day. Because everything women do is, well, because everything women do is irrelevant in the media and not worth to be mentioned. We would change this, even though it is obvious that it is women who keep the world functioning with their efforts against violence, war, and the destruction of the climate. The thousand women did not receive the, the Nobel Peace Prize, but in consultation with all partners and with common goals, we continued the work to work. The network of the thousand women has now grown and we are an international, we are an 
international organization. Together, this is an important feature of our cooperation together, together with our partner organizations and under their leadership, peace tables are being created in many countries with an important goal that more women are involved in peace processes. Some of our guidelines are the UN Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security and other important conventions that are intended to improve the status and living conditions of women. We are pleased that the network is growing. We are pleased about the, the many contacts and discussions, even if they are sometimes painful, but usually constructive and binding. I would, I would like to thank Marco, King Chi, Sima, Faicha, you were the people from the first minute of our project. And I think I thank also the translators for her great work. And I would like also to thank the International Office of Peace Women Across the Globe. Of, for, I would thank Anna Marie and Carla for their great and substantial, substantial support. Thank you so much. And I'm very curious what we will hear now. Thank you, Gabi, for giving us that uh, brief history. And I invite participants, uh, you in the audience, to go to our website. Uh, it's www.1000peacewomen.org. And there's lots of interesting information there. Um, so we'll start now. And I'd like to give a kind of a background for the project, for, for these sessions, and then um, just give an overview for this particular session on colonization. So the current moment, although we know that it's historically bound, it's not, the moment is not a, a historical, as um, uh, Kinchi reminded us earlier, right? The current moment, the pandemic combined with global uprisings and state responses to both demands us feminists around the world to stand in solidarity. And to do so, we must take the time to think together across regions and other borders in, in order to understand the current material conditions and the political situations in more nuanced ways, right? Uh, to imagine feminist futures that will enable us to really secure livelihoods, sustain the natural environment, and ensure the dignity and well-being of all living beings. And finally, to organize transnationally as feminists to realize that vision. We recognize that neoliberal capitalism, right-wing ethno-populism and nationalism religious fundamentalisms, militarism, colon colonialism, and imperialism form the foundations of the world in which we exist. Right. Region-specific forms of patriarchy and male dominance, anti-blackness and other forms of racism, ethnocentrism, class, caste, and heterosexist and transphobia, uh, ecological violence and other intertwined life destroying forces are manifested through and buttressed uh, by the forces above. So our session um, is intended to be, the, the, the two days are intended to bring uh, activists and academics, policy people um, uh, as presenters, but also as audience members to really try to think big, try to imagine possibilities and to raise questions that we may not necessarily uh, have the space or the time to think about. So we organize the, um, the, these days, these six sessions around the following concepts and questions. One is thinking about the landscape, right? Um, what is this moment, moment telling us societally and globally about what we should let go and change 
and what we should hold on to and do differently and better. We're also asking uh, us to think about this question of yearnings, right? What are the things tugging at your heart, um, your spirit, both, both personally and politically in this moment? And in that context, what have you heard, what have you learned about yourself during this particular crisis? And I know that, you know, among the presenters here, the crisis is an extreme manifestation of some of the things that you've been experiencing for a long time. Then uh, the next question is imagining. Right? What can we imagine about a feminist future that can fully account for the answers to the first two questions about the landscape and about your yearnings? And then finally, the doing. Right? What are feminists doing that, uh, that moves us toward realizing the vision, right? And visions. And then the additional question is, what else needs to be uh, done? What else should we be doing? And um, I was thinking as I um, attended the other you know, sessions, really, how do we face, as activists, most of us have been doing this work for a long time. How do we confront, face, admit, confront our disappointments also, right? That um, we can't have imagined what we're facing now in some ways, right? Not the pandemic uh, for sure. And so how, what are our disappointments and how are we confronting them and how are we, um, dealing with them. So that's the overall uh, big picture of these uh, two, two days. Specifically for this session on uh, colonization, occupation, militarism, and feminist piecework, we wanted you all to share with us the kind of the specifics um, of, of your situation. And you know, this, this group was chosen because it, it presents a really very important range, right, of the, the contemporary scenes. So, for example, New Zealand may look very peaceful, right? You, have a, you seem to have a wonderful prime minister uh, from what we hear in the news, but then there are the lives of indigenous people, right? And, and the, it's still a settler colony, right? Then we have the situation in Guam that is a colony of the U.S. completely dominated by the U.S. military. And then we have Afghanistan, the U.S. war in Afghanistan, all the problems that that's created and problems is an understatement. And we finally have the uh, 70 year, uh, 70 plus years uh, history of um, the occupation of Palestine and uh, occupation of Palestinian people. So it's a different kinds of um, occupations and colonization and, and colonial histories. And so we wanted to pull this together to just do a kind of comparing and contrasting, but also really see across these different contexts, what are the similarities? What are the forces, you know, that are um, uh, going across not only regions, but across time, right? not just regions, but across time. So um, thank you again very much for, for coming and spending your time with us. I know all of you are very, very busy. So we'll start the conversation um, with um, uh, uh, Faiha Abdul Hadi, who is one of the uh, regional coordinators of Peace Women Across the Globe, and I want to claim you, Faiha, publicly as my friend, my sister friend. Faiha has extensive experience as a writer, poet, oral historian, researcher, and research consultant, community activist, and lecturer. And Faiha has, Faiha has been working on gender and other issues of human interest. She's the founder and director of Arawat for Studies and Research, which seeks to rewrite social history by documenting stories of marginalized groups 
and of witnesses to key historic events. And that's a really important part of the themes that have come up during the other uh, three, uh, four sessions at this point, right? To document the voices of uh, um, people whose stories uh, are not uh, regularly um, uh, documented. So, Faiha, thank you very much. And uh, please uh, start. Thank you, Margot. Thank you, my friend, Margot. Thank you, Kenshi. Thank you, uh, Gabi, uh, my friend. And uh, greetings, good morning first, and greetings from Palestinians uh, in Palestine and across the globe. Uh, so, ever since the world became infected with COVID-19, we have faced many questions, some realistic and practical, other philosophical and cosmic. Are we in a real or a virtual world? Will the pandemic unite us or increase our alienation, division and individualism? What do we do today, tomorrow? What will we ever do? The first of these urgent questions is, is what we all suffer today the result of past policies? I believe that our suffering today is a result of past policies. Racist policies, injustice, terrorism, inequality, impunity, and violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Faiha, Faiha, may I just uh -huh. ask you to speak a little bit slower because of the interpreters? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Thank fine, you. fine, yes. Those policies are indifferent to the economic, social, and cultural rights of a human being and do not, therefore, guarantee education, a healthy environment, work, uh, culture, social security, food, water, and housing to ensure a dignified life. These rights can be achieved through the unity of people of all races, religions, political, political trends, and social and economic backgrounds in a way that guarantees freedom and dignity for all human beings. Past policies have replaced the dedication of budgets to knowledge and scientific research, which could arrive at a treatment to, find, to fight pandemics and incurable diseases with large budgets for making and selling weapons, environmental pollution, and the spread of chemical and new nuclear toxins. The increase in the proportion of global military expenditures in 2019 by 4%, the largest increase recorded in nearly a decade, is an evidence that the priorities of many countries of the world do not include human freedom or the preservation of human dignity. The best example of making and selling arms as a priority is the Israeli colonial entity, which uses its occupation of Palestine as the best investment for its arms trade and for promoting this trade as tested weapons. You know all what happened in Gaza, 2014, 2018, etc., etc. They were trying their weapons there. There is no doubt that these, those who pay a bigger price than others are the peoples who fall into the grips of occupation, colonization, imperialism, social groups that suffer from discrimination, inequality, injustice, and poverty. And women, children, refugees, uh, persons with disabilities, people with limited incomes, marginalized and unemployed people. Women have long linked militarization to violence against women because they believe that militarization is one of the structures that promotes violence against women. 
It is an ide ideology that builds a culture of fears, fear and supports the use of violence, aggression, and military interventions to resolve conflicts and impose economic hegemony. Militarization is not limited to war zones. It extends to the domestic sphere, where it is linked with invisible form of violence, invisible forms of violence, where it is linked with invisible forms of violence. This is what the 16 Days to Eliminate Violence Against Women campaign called for in 2010. You remember that, sure. Also, to raise in 2015 the slogan linking militarism with the right to education in the situation of violent conflict, referring to the nature of militarism as a comprehensive patriarchal system based on discrimination. In Palestine, moreover, the Palestinian NGO Forum launched the 2015 national campaign against violence against women under the slogan, ending the occupation, ending the violence. In 2018, the slogans, we reject the continuous forced displacement of Bedouin and refugee Palestinians women. And the slogan, we have the right to live in safety. And in 2019, the slogan, we are all against the violence, were launched. It is here important to shed light on the nature of the long racist colonial Israeli occupation of Palestine, the longest military occupation in the, in the uh, modern world. It's the last one, actually. And on why and how the Israeli occupation state violates international law. Michael Link, the United Nations Special Repertoire on Human Rights in Palestine referred to four criteria of violation of international law by an occupying state. An occupied state cannot, cannot annex an occupied territory. Second, occupation is temporary. Second, the occupied must end occupation as soon as possible. The third, the occupier must act in the inter interests of the population. The fourth, the occupying authority must act in good faith. And since Israel violates the four criteria, therefore, the Security Council described its colonial scheme in more than one occasion as illegal. The more important issue is that the long-term occupation is not subject to questioning. With full impunity to violate and deny the Palestinian right to self-determination. The challenge faced by the international community is to implement the necessary diplomatic and legal steps that let that lead to end the occupation that lead to end the occupation finally and totally the occupation of israeli continues to violate international humanitarian law and international human rights law and this was confirmed by the report of the united nations independent international commission of inquiry into events related to the return marches in the gaza strip which was submitted to the Human Rights Council at the end of February 2019, according to which the occupying forces may have committed war crimes. There are logical reasons to believe that Israel snipers shot Palestinian civilians, including journalists, paramedics, children, and persons with disabilities during the return marches between March and December 2019. One of the most prominent developments that took place in December 2019 was the issuance of a decision by the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to direct the situation in Palestine to the pre-trial chamber of the International Criminal Court and the intention to open a full formal criminal investigation into possible war crimes committed in Palestine. Since 1967, 
we have witnessed in Palestine continued Israeli violations of international human rights law, the foremost of which is the right to live, to housing, to a clean environment, to movement, to education, and to freedom of expression. Consequently, the suffering of the Palestinian people has been aggravated, ag aggravated politically, uh, economically, socially, and culturally. The Israeli occupation forces continue to detain the bodies of the martyrs. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, detaining the body of the martyrs and to deny their families the right to bury their, their children in a suitable and dignified way, which is inconsistent with every international value, law and norm. The occupation forces practices field executions, arbitrary arrests, target children and women, and use of both sexes, confiscate lands, cut down olive trees, erect the wall of annexation and apartheid, demolish homes and facilities, and con continue to build settlements. It was continued since the uh, early uh, uh, 20th century. The settler attacks backed up by the Israeli forces increased sharply in the context of the occupation government's policy of supporting settlement settlers and settlement uh, expansions and settlers against international law and security council decision number 2334 issued on the 23rd of december 2016 requesting the occupying state to stop building colonies in the palestinian areas occupied in 1967 and to stop building illegal settlements the collective punishment of the Gaza Strip, where the blockade has con continued since 2007, violates basic human rights in the Strip, causing a, deteriorating, causing a deterioration of health, the economic and social situation. The increase in unemployment and poverty affected more than 2 million people in 2019. Recently, the so-called Trump's vision of peace, completely devoid of any meaning of peace, was launched. In all simplicity, it denies the rights of the Palestinians, calling, calling them the Palestinian residents, and tries to find solution for them within a fragmented entity that does not have the components, the components of a state. It adopts the racist Israeli vision of greater Israel and supports the possibility of Israel annexa annexation large areas up to 30% of the West Bank, areas where illegal Israeli uh, colonies are located, the Jordan Valley and the Northern Dead Sea, in addition to the areas west of the segregation wall, which was condemned by the High Court of Justice in 2004, if you remember based on its illegality, which ruled that it must be removed. The Israeli Prime Minister declared that the announcement of the annexation is part of the Israeli government's policy, which comes in addition to annexing occupied East Jerusalem. You can see here uh, what kind of state the plan is, propos is proposing. You know, you can see all the areas near the river, the, it is, uh, it, uh, the, the plan is, going to, is saying that it will be annexed. All the areas near the river. And you can see the gray areas where the settlements are there, it's the building settlements everywhere. And you can see the blue area where supposed to be the state of Palestine. No entity, it's, it's, you can see the fragmentation there, and about the arrow, arrows you can see here, it's the roads for one road, roads for Palestinians and road for the Israelis, which shows racism clearly. Uh, of, of course, here you can see also um, the bridges. Here, the bridges, the arrows show, sh shows 
the bridges and tunnels that it is also cutting the Palestinian uh, uh, areas, which is, you can see there is no components at all for a, a state, a Palestinian state. It's very clear. The annexation plan comes as an extension of the ethnic cleansing plan in Palestine, practiced by the Zionist forces, backed up by the British mandate for Palestine in the year 1948. The policy came in conformity with a declaration issued by the British Prime Minister Arthur Balfour to Lionel Rothschild in 1917 that would support to establish a national homeland for the Jews in Palestine. Uh, here you can see Palestine as it was, as, an, as, uh, as should be, as should be. 1947, you can see the green area, it is Palestine. And you can see the other one, the second one, uh, after the partition plan, 1947. How through the four phases, you can see how it fades. Uh, the third one, Palestine, 1949 to 19 and 1967, you can see Palestine shrinking and fading. And then you can see the fourth one, Palestine in present time. Fragmentation, no entity, no way they want us to accept this uh, so-called state, which is not state at all. All these policies are a serious violation of international law as described, descri described by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, and many countries in Europe and the world. These policies require that the international community, governments, people, and civil society organizations to move fast and prevent the occurrence of annexation and to end the racial Israeli colonial occupation and settlements in the land of Palestine. So, if we are fighting for independence and freedom, what is the identity of the Palestinian society that we want in Palestine? What are its components? Our society, as Palestinian documents affirms, affirm is one of justice, equality, liberties, and the rule of law. If the Palestinian people seek rights and justice, no justice, nor the rule of law and equality in the comprehensive sense can be achieved except in a country that enjoys independence and national social and political control and sovereignty. The women of Palestine believe that an occupied country cannot enjoy independence with only half of its human citizens, of, its hu of, of, of the half of its human force. If equality is not achieved without the freedom of the country, then without equality, the freedom of the nation and the human beings will not be achieved. What is the concept of a peace for Palestinian women? How does she challenge military thought and define equality? The concept of feminist peace is not limited to ending the Israeli occupation of Palestine. It's wider and links the salvation from violence and the control of resources with human security. The concept also includes the achievement of a just and viable peace. Gender equality is another criteria it's another critical dimension in the definition of peace and security for women. Palestinian women have rejected the saying, either a political or a social struggle. They linked their social cause to the cause of liberating their nation from colonialism. This connection was embodied by their continuous and stubborn struggle, struggle to achieve their social goals at the same time that they fought against the colonizer and in defense of the question of Palestine. Palestinian women became aware that national liberation from the grips of colonialism and occupation does not necessarily mean women's 
emancipation. They set their sights on the example of Algerian women with all respect to Algerian struggle, long, long struggle. Although the patriarchal relations were severely shaken during the war, and women in Algeria began to be represented in, represented in parliament or women organizations, this presence could have been completed and extended, but women were abruptly removed from the political field after the liberation and restricted to working, working with women organizations only. It is of note that the more Palestinian women struggle to achieve their political, social, and cultural rights, the more they fight against unjust discrimination, the more attacks against them intensify. Campaigns were started to throw doubts on pioneering women in Palestine, on institutions that work to empower women politically, economically, socially, and culturally, and on laws and legislation, legis legislations that do some justice to women, and international agreements which consider women's rights as human rights, like the Convention on the elimination of all, all forms of discrimination, SIDAO, against women, SIDAO, which is dedicated to the principles of equality and fairness and respects human dignity. Today in Palestine, women are fighting through organized and mass frameworks, a battle to harmonize national legislation in Palestine with international conventions ratified by the state of Palestine and disseminating the Sidao agreement in the official Gazette. They also strive to, uh, the, the official Gazette, they also strive to ratify a draft resolution on the law to protect the family from violence, the draft of panel code and to implement the decisions of the central councils which have approved the representation of women in the institutions of the Palestinian Liberation Organization by at least 30%. It is a call not, all, that not only for victory for women, but rather a call to victory for the values of justice, fairness, and truth. There will be no peace in the world unless we review our policies. We, sh we should fight together to eliminate all pandemics. Pandemics, we should eradicate colonialism, foreign occupation, discrimination, all forms of racism, and the savage new liberal economic policies in order to achieve justice for all human beings. We should work together as women and work as women and men to fight violence, violence on all levels. No women no peace, no women, no human security. By defying military thought, we prevent women, men, and children from the terrors of war. By challenging, challenging military thinking, we make peace in the private space and in the public space, at home and on the street, in the field and in the factory, at school and in the office. By defying military thought, we pursue war criminals and reap human security. By defying military thought, we ascertain our humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, amazing comprehensive history and current reality of what's happening in Palestine. And thank you for connecting all the dots uh, with other struggle uh, and uh, gender and so forth. Thank you so much. Um, next, we will hear from Seema Samar. She, yep. she is a medical doctor, so maybe she can help us with this virus, <laughs> but I doubt it. <laughs> She's a medical doctor by profession, but a human rights activist. She was the first minister for women's affairs after the fall of Taliban. She's the chairperson of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, the first established in the country. Thank you so much for being with us, Seema. Um, their friends, sisters, colleagues, uh, 
greeting to all of you and salam to all of you. Uh, I will start by uh, the first to to talk about the first uh, article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says that all human beings born equal and free, and all of them has the rights in dignity. So that is something that if we look at the whole, uh, this article is enough to, to change the world and promote equality and freedom around the world and digni dignity and dignified life for everyone. Um, my sister from Palestine uh, spoke about uh, occupation, but we in Afghanistan, we have different kinds of occupation. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the history of the of the country. We are also, unfortunately, at war since 42 years. Uh, a different kind of colonialization. Sorry, I, this is a difficult word to say. Anyway, colonization. Uh, I think what was happened in Afghanistan is a small country um, in Asia uh, or geopolitical situation or location of the country is always causing a problem and continued conflict and war uh, in the country and promote the suffering of the people, unfortunately. Um, we, ha we were a, a small country and not very developed, uh, poor country, but there was kind of a, a system in the country which people were happy, although people were poor and there was not enough job opportunity and not enough, uh, I would say, all the freedom, but it was not really limited as it is used to be during the war by different groups. So in, uh, what's happened in 1978, there was a coup d'etat uh, done by the people who were supported by USSR on that time. We had actually two political parties which were both in the same way and both were supported by the USSR. But one was called Par Khalq and the other one was called Parcham. Khalq means uh, people, Parcham means uh, flag. So both, uh, both of these groups were supported by USSR and then uh, because we were close to USSR than, than the Western countries, uh, um, you all remember that up to the northern um, border of Afghanistan, it was USSR already. Now it's Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan. It's three stone, but at that time it was the USSR. So we had the, uh, the coup d'etat in the country. As soon as the coup d'etat happened, Unfortunately, they began to restrict the freedom and the rights of the people. That's why I, I um, cited the, the first article of the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then the people began to, uh, to resist against these people, uh, against the government, which they took the government in power by coup d'etat, as I mentioned. Uh, then they formed a government and this two uh, pro-Russian, you know, pro-USSR party was, was brought together by the pressure by, uh, by USSR and they divided the different position in the cabinet in the country among themselves. Unfortunately, we still divide the, the position uh, in Afghanistan. So the, as soon as they took the power, they announced different laws in order by the president who was Nur Muhammad Taraki and he was the head of the Khalq, and then the prime minister was the uh, Parcham leader. Uh, it didn't last long because they started to fight among themselves, uh, unfortunately. So then uh, they, they planned and restricted the people's basic human rights. People were not able to go to the mosque. People were not, they didn't have any freedom of expression and freedom of media was completely gone. Everything was for Hulk and then all the, most of the building in the country everywhere was painted in, in red. 
and nobody was allowed to speak anything against these people. Um, people were not able to uh, have the freedom or use the freedom of movement, and uh, they did not have the right to vote, um, and they did not have the, the um, simply the right to to, to, to choose the way they are uh, going to do their wedding or their um, exercise, their, their uh, uh, religious affairs. Then the people start to fight against them. What was happened on that time because of the, the fear that they, they, took, they already came to Afghanistan and then they would come to, uh, because the pro-USSR party in Iran was quite, quite uh, powerful on that time. They had another uh, political party called Toda, uh, which is also masses, means masses or people. And they were afraid that it will be um, a pro-USSR coup d'etat in Iran. And then the Western countries, including the US and British mainly, and the Arab Islamic countries, they really, the US actually had the plan to build a green zone around Afghanistan to stop the USSR advancement in the South Asia more. So that, that's why they allowed the uh, Khomeini uh, kind of a code, different kind of coup d'etat or taking the power from the king. Um, and then they uh, promoted the Islamization of Ziaulaq in Afghanistan. So that was the green uh, built uh, policy. Unfortunately, it was done during Car Carter President Carter, which was Democrat. So then uh, in 1979, because the, the people start uh, to resist against the government, the Russian practically, and, and that was uh, in January, in December 2000, uh, 1979, they came with a, a lot of their soldiers in Afghanistan. So it was constant plain noise in Kabul city for a whole week and nobody knew because people were not, first of all, technology was not advanced as it is today and the people were not allowed to go to, near to the, to the airport. If the, the people would have gone to look what is happening, that was enough to be arrested and killed. They start to arbitrarily arrest people, uh, torture badly, People were disappeared. Thousands of people were disappeared. And without any, any excuse, without any uh, accusation, without any fair trial, or without even any list of their name in the, in the government. So the, the Russian came to Afghanistan to support the uh, so-called revolution. Uh, and the, the, the fight between the two group of Khalq and Parcham so the Khalqis took the power and sent most of the Pashtunis as, as ambassador outside of Afghanistan. So they sent the leadership of Pasham to uh, East uh, Europe, on that time Czechoslovakia and Bulgaria and Romania, and those places, and um, took the power on their own control, only the Khalq, uh, part of the, of the uh, pro-Russian. Uh, party. So that is then the Parcham leadership, who was uh, Babra Karmal, who was uh, ambassador in Czechoslovakia. He somehow he was close to the USSR to Moscow, and then he went to convince the USSR that the current people who are in power in Kabul, the Khalqis, they will not be able to defend the revolution which has happened in Afghanistan. So somehow, then they, uh, they, uh, they tried to, to come with their soldier and kill the, uh, the prime minister on that time or the president on that time who was, um, Taraki was already killed by his own uh, so-called students. That is uh, kind of a turn to be a proverb in Afghanistan that the students are not anymore um, very honest to their leaders, so to their teachers, or very loyal to their teachers. That is uh, kind of a joke among all of us because 
Hafiz Lamin, who killed Taraki, was uh, his student. Uh, then Babrak Kormal came from Russia with the, um, with the uh, Russian USSR soldier in Afghanistan. The first statement he had was from Tashkent. Uh, so this is so interesting. Uh, they, there were no shame on people's uh, occupying this kind, uh, um, coming to power in this way. Uh, <clears throat> then we had 10 years of brutal war in the country. They bombed the, uh, the villages, they bombed the, even the water sources in the country, they bombed the animals of the people, the livestock of the people, uh, without any kind of accountability. What was happened actually in the, um, in the, United, in the UN, they only condemned the, uh, the USSR invasion to Afghanistan. That was all. I mean, what was happening, they started to, a lot of people started to go to Pakistan and Iran. And uh, it was a good source for Pakistani government and for Arabs and, and uh, the um, Americans to use that very conservative, backward, uh, uneducated people in order to train them to be very fundamentalist right wing that we all suffer today from that kind of mentality to fight against communism in Afghanistan. So the whole, the whole war with the Russian war continued for 10 years with all those brutal, um, anything you, you can imagine was happened during the time and unfortunately continues in different way. And the, then the Mujahideen group was brought up in, in Pakistan mainly. There was other group of people who went to, U to Iran because of their uh, religious um, connection to Iran being Shia in, in Iran. And the problem with Iran and the US and the, the Western countries because of the, uh, they took the uh, American diplomats hostage in Iran. So it was uh, another problem. So they, Iran didn't receive a lot of support by the Western countries in order to support the Afghan refugees in Iran. But Pakistan received a lot of the support, and, and that's why the Pakistanis are started the uh, madrasas, the religious school for the Afghan children. And of course, because of poverty, because of lack of uh, livelihood, because of um, having a lot of children in their family, the families, the Afghan families, were ready to give their children to the, those madrasas in order to be educated and also to be fed it and all, giving them clothes and, and living. So that was the, one of the, um, the plan that they really focused on that. And no women were, uh, were mentioned and no women had no, no role on those. And practically the, the pro-Russian, the, the pro-USSR in Afghanistan, they wanted to use the promotion of equality between men and women in different way in Afghanistan. For example, they were promoting the, the girls to come and sing on the stage, which is also part of the, the rights and, and freedom, but that is not the only thing. So what was happened against that policy, uh, the Mujahideen group, the, the resistant group, completely ignored women and women rights. And the supporter, the Western countries, U.S. and uh, mainly British and, and Arab countries were saying that Af Afghans are traditional, Afghans are conservative, Afghans are very traditional Muslims, so they are not allowing their women and girls to be educated or to be uh, outside of the house. So there was no single support for women during that 10 years of uh, Russian occupation. Some of us, when we were working in Pakistan as a refugee, we were really under threat. A lot of women were threatening and, and the educated one left for, for Australia and for Europe and for the US. But very few of us, we will continue to, to fight and stay there. So and finally, after 10 years of Russian occupation, US, Pakistan, Afghanistan and USSR 
uh, had a uh, had a peace agreement in Geneva. Again, all women, all men, no women, and no no consultation with women. I mean, the, there was some consultation among the uh, Mujahideen groups and so on, but with all only men, uh, a group of those people. Uh, in 1988, they signed an accord in Geneva, again, male-dominated policies and everything. Uh, the Russian began to withdraw their troops from Afghanistan. So finally, in 1989, uh, the last soldier of USSR left the country. Because of the um, economical problem that the USSR itself was, uh, was facing, and you, we all know Gorbachev came with his uh, prostarica policy. And then in 1992, but the, the regime, which was still Dr. Najib, um, from 1989 survived until 1992 because the UN at that time was going to different countries. Uh, for example, Benan Suwan was a SRSG, a special representative of United Nations in Afghanistan. He was having his uh, breakfast in Islamabad, his lunch in Kabul, and then his dinner was in Tehran in order to bring all these groups together and have a peace deal. Again, very, very much male-dominated. No woman was involved. We, even when we were raising our voice and criticizing, nobody was listening to us. So finally, in 1992, before Benan Suwan began his, his negotiation and division of power between Mujahideen and that, and that time the, and the government, uh, the government uh, failed because they began to fight among themselves. Again, General Dostum is one of the biggest militia, actually. He was, he was the reason to fail the, uh, the government uh, because Najib wanted to escape to India. Uh, he stopped Najib on the airport. Uh, and then Najib went to the um, United Nations guest house and stayed there until Taliban took him out in 1996 and killed him and hung his body on the street, on the uh, stand of the electricity for a few days, which was also against human dignity, I would say. Mujahideen went in 1994 uh, in Afghanistan, and what they decided to do, uh, a transitional government in this, established in Islamabad, it was only the Sunni and uh, Mujahideen group, which was funded mainly by the USSR, by the uh, USA and, and uh, Arabic countries and Western countries. So they established a transitional government in Islamabad, and they pushed them to Afghanistan. Uh, they they came to Afghanistan, and then they began to not to share power with anyone. No Hazaras, no women. Women were not even in the in the agenda. But even for the Hazaras and the Shias in the country, they said they they are very small number of the country, of the people in the country, so they don't have the right to be part of the government. So they, as soon as they came to Kabul, they start to fight among each other. So there were no rule of law. Everybody uh, who had the power, they took that part of the country, different part of the country, different part of Kabul even, was controlled by different uh, political groups or armed groups, I would say. Um, every kind of a violation continued. The first thing the Mujahideen government had to announce that the Afghan woman has to preserve the, fee, uh, the, the Islamic hijab. There was a story what one of the minister, which was belonged to uh, Etihad Islami, he went to the, uh, to the ministry, the Ministry of um, Mines uh, in the country, and it was a lot of women working in the ministry on that time. He announced, he said that the female staff of the ministry cannot come today to see him. He only is willing to see the male staff that first day when he was in the ministry because the woman did not preserve the Islamic hijab. Next day, this same minister brought a bunch of big scarves for women and divided the scarf first and then let them come in and talk to the Mr. Minister. And they start to announce on the, on the television and the, we had only one television and one national radio 
that women ha have to preserve the hijab and their body curves should not be seen by any men in the country. So they began to do that. And the first thing that they said that women cannot really uh, present the, um, the news, then they were putting a rose, but uh, a lady was reading the, um, the rose was in the screen, but the lady was reading the, the news. And then they said, the, oh, the unrelated female voice should not be heard by men. So they even removed the woman for, from um, reading the news. In 1994, when we had the, uh, all remember that it was the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, the Afghan government did not send any delegation to that conference because they said they're discussing on Islamic uh, agendas and topics, so we are not going to participate. So it shows that we were more Muslim than, than Saudi and Egypt and, and all the other Islamic countries. We were the first, the only country not to send a delegation. In 1995, it was same because it was Mujahideen government. So when it was the Beijing conference, we did not send any delegation to that conference because again, the government was saying, first they said that we sent all of our delegation, a female delegation with their mahram, with the male member of their family and partners. But then uh, later on that they announced that they cannot really send any delegation to that because it's on, they're discussing on Islamic. Again, we were the, the guardian of Islam. And then in 1994, Taliban took power in Kandahar and then 1996 they took Kabul. They did everything. I don't have to repeat. They were not allowing women to, to walk on the street because they're, 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 um, the noise of their shoes will disturb the men. And you could see that they were beating up. No, uh, ch the children were not allowed to uh, use a car, to fly a kite because they were saying it. It looks like a bird, so there is a competition with God. We are, we are not, we as a human, we cannot really produce all these living things. Children were not allowed to, to play with any toy which looks like, like living um, items or living objects. Uh, and also if they had a music. Music was not allowed, photos were not allowed, television were not allowed. But currently, this, our lovely uh, Taliban leaders are sitting in Qatar every day and uh, have using the show, social media. And every day they are in television and uh, photos are around uh, everywhere. So the, all the uh, rights and, and the freedom of the people were, were violated. It was not only women. The men had no rights. They were cutting the hair of a man on the street if it was as long as my hair, for example. But now they, they themselves has a hair which is almost 30 centimeter or 50 centimeter long. So there is a double standard in um, using Islam and culture uh, against women all the time. Okay. Uh, As, uh, Seema, can you begin to wind down? Well, I'm not done but i try to um, okay but 9 11 was happened and um, and it was now we have uh, nato and the american in afghanistan it's 18 years uh, they came because they said that they are going to protect the women's rights and now when they're leaving there's no women's rights on their agenda at all uh, and it's always dependent on their internal politics rather than uh, really protecting human rights in Afghanistan everywhere, not only in our country, but it's the same in Iraq and same wherever they go, uh, in Libya or any other countries. Um, <clears throat> the, most of the, uh, the policies and the politics in the country was, um, of course, um, belong to the countries who are supporting Afghanistan, unfortunately. Um, now what is happening? We have uh, Americans in Afghanistan since 18 years, and you all know that they are going to, uh, they already signed a peace agreement with Taliban on uh, 29th of February, 2020. And this agreement, there was no Afghan people, 
Afghans were not involved. I would say the uh, non-Taliban Afghans, because Taliban are also Afghan, but they were involved. Uh, the Afghan government was not involved, so women were not there even. The word human rights is not even in the, uh, on the agenda of these, uh, this peace uh, process. And now they tried to begin uh, the withdrawal of the troops because Mr. Trump wants to win the election. Uh, what is happening with pandemic? Um, I think pandemic showed us or taught us that the military or militarization, military power or militarization, uh, even with the mother bomb that they put in Afghanistan, uh, they could not really uh, push or, uh, or finish da um, Daesh and Taliban. Um, we have another um, style of Daesh, the ISIS in Afghanistan, which they call themselves Khurasan Daesh branch. Um, <clears throat> so that militarization does not really protect us. What really we want uh, as, a, um, um, as a feminist, I would like to see as a feminist policy after COVID-19 would be, we will have a better world if we do not spend money on militarization and making bombs and rockets and all these missiles that we don't know for whom we should. We use it for destroying people, not really helping people to stand on their feet. Uh, we need a better world for an uh, equal world. I think that is the second point that I would like to mention. The third point, instead of uh, militarization, I think we should spend that much of budget in, in resources for uh, supporting the basic social services and also on the uh, rule of law. The fourth point that I would like to mention uh, is clearly no one should lift behind. This is the um, the slogan with the SDG, although I, I have to be uh, very honest that I'm very pessimistic that we, we will not be able to really um, implement the SDG in order to um, save the human dignity and um, promote equality in the, in the country, uh, uh, in the planet, I would say. Um, the the final point that I would like to mention that we have to fight against uh, poverty and we cannot fight against poverty unless we empower women and uh, facilitate their access to family planning and reproductive rights. Otherwise, uh, we all know that most of the poor uh, around the globe, not only in my country, but around the globe are women and those should be empowered and should be uh, pull out of poverty. Otherwise, we are not going to come up with a, uh, with a just peace and a um, reform uh, or a better world after COVID. Although I don't know what will be the, the after COVID, but uh, I think we as a feminist, we should uh, struggle for this and fight for this and be united in order to promote rights and freedom and dignity for everybody, including ourselves. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I was long. Yeah, Thanks thank a lot. I, I hope it was not really boring. No, I think what's good about both your presentation and Baiha's is the, the uh, we got a very good history lesson and uh, heard about things that, especially in the US, we didn't, you know, we did not hear about. Uh, so thank you for that. And you know, let's just take a moment here, since we've heard a lot from uh, both our panelists. And just what do you notice about the similarities in those two situations, right? Uh, and even though they're, especially if you put it in a historical context, right? and I'm thinking about, you know, things like impunity, for example, uh, the role of um, outsiders in uh, determining people's fate, uh, the fate of nations. I'm um, also thinking about the ways in which uh, the European colonization and then more regionally Japanese colonization uh, and 
uh, later U.S. colonization, as well as the Cold War, how those two sets of things really shaped um, the destiny of, of the world in so many ways. And, um, you know, as, as I was listening to you all, just thinking about this question of when and what are post, like what is post-colonial, what does post-war uh, actually mean in practice? Uh, and and so forth. So um, before we go to the next two presenters, I know that um, I asked um, uh, uh, you all to bring music or a poem or something. And I think Faiha, you you said you had you had a poem that you wanted to share. And as we're trying to take in the facts, you know that were um, shared with us, maybe we can also engage you know another part of our brain before we move to the next two speakers because it's a lot to take in short poem short yeah thank you yeah uh in countries unlike my own the wind still whistles the trees give fruit the skies have its sunrise the river still flows the sea roars the rain falls, people still laugh, people still miss. In my country, the wind waits its permit to blow, the river its permit to flow, the picklock its permit to sing, the rain its permit to weep. In my country, only the heart grows without permit, only liberty explode without warning. So now we'll shift uh, a bit regionally, but not necessarily the colonization process and militarism. So I'd like to introduce you all to um, Lisa Natividad. Lisa Linda Natividad is a professor of social work at the University of Guam and a founding member of uh, Ai Hagan Famalao and Guahan, Daughters of the Women of Guahan, which is the original name of Guam. She commits her energies to work for decolonization, demilitarization, and the empowerment of women. Thank you, Lisa, for being here with us. Sidos Marci Margo, and half a day, everyone. Um, and I, before I get started with my PowerPoint, um, I just wanted to honor and acknowledge um, the sacred stories that were shared by Faiha and by Sima, um, because we in the Pacific who are absolutely complicit in US militarism, um, we speak of war and what we, when, when we speak of war and we talk about its destruction, we seldom have a face of what and who that destruction impacts. And you both through your stories have very illustratively given us sort of that missing piece of our puzzle. And so I'm uh, very grateful for that. Um, and stand in solidarity with you uh, for peace as militarization in a different shape and form has also affected our community in Guahan. And so, okay. Okay, and so um, I come from the island of Guahan, more popularly known to the rest of the world as Guam. And we are a United States unincorporated territory. Um, we are located in the Mariana region of the Micronesian region in the Pacific. And so we also have a long history of old, what I refer to as old school colonization. Um, and it's old school colonization because our history stems back to having um, inhabited our island chain and our being the Chamorro people. Um, we inhabited our island chain almost 4,000 years ago. And um, our first contact and stumble with the Western world was in the 1500s. We were later claimed by the country of Spain in the 1600s. Uh, settlements were set up and following the Spanish American war in 1898, our hands then, or we were then given purchased, um, whatever way you want to describe that process, through the Treaty of Paris to the United States. Uh, we remain under the U.S.'s control. Um, there was a brief period 
in World War II between 1941 and 1944, wherein the island was occupied by the Japanese Imperial Army, um, and then the United States came back to overtake the island um, in 1944, and we continue to be a U.S. colony today. Um, as you can see in this map, um, our island, Guahan, is in so many ways the center point of the Asia-Pacific pivot of the U.S.'s military strategy. And so you can see through the red arrows, a number of uh, military triangles and stages of which our island is connected um, with close proximity to the west with Hawaii and San Diego, as well as in so many ways being the gateway to the east um, with military bases that stem as far down as Australia into Indonesia, the Philippines, um, as well as uh, Korea and Japan. And so as occupied territory, we of course have experienced lots of land dispossession. Um, our island, which is a very small locale, we're about 212 square miles. Um, we about 27, between 27 and 29 percent of the island, depending on what you count, is controlled by the Department of Defense of the United States, occupying over 35,000 acres. Um, and in contrast, our local government of Guam only owns about 19% of the island or over 25,000 acres. And so the Department of Defense controls more than all private landowners combined on the island. And um, in 2006, the governments of Japan and the United States entered into an accord um, indicating the transfer of U.S. Marines from Okinawa, Japan to our island. And as a result of that, uh, has set into motion a very long, in-depth military buildup process on the island. Um, and with this military plant has revealed the desecration of a number of our ancient uh, village and historical sites and cultural sites. Uh, initially, what was identified was a village called Pogget. Currently, there's threat to a village called Natexan. And, and all of this is to construct a live firing range complex that's comprised of five ranges. And so Guahan as a U.S. unincorporated territory means we do have U.S. passports. We're U.S. passport holders. Um, however, there are a number of restrictive federal territorial policies that inhibit the development of a viable economy, for example. Um, and this is one example of this is referred to as the, Z the Jones Act. As a territory, we are of limited federal funding. Uh, one calculation says we receive only about one seventh the funding that is afforded to U.S. states. Clearly, there's no consultation in the build-up planning process of increased militarization on the island. Um, in addition, there's an exclusion of standard U.S. social programs that include things like unemployment insurance, social security, disability insurance, and other such programs. Um, we do not have the opportunity to vote for the U.S. president, and um, we also have very limited participation of one congressional representative who has what's referred to as no true vote in the US Congress. And so what is military occupation meant for our people? Um, clearly land dispossession, as I had mentioned earlier. In addition to that, it's meant um, nuclear testing, exposure to nuclear testing. And so you see the little boy on the top uh, left-hand corner of the slide. Um, as well as the development, of course, of military bases. So the picture on the bottom with, with um, U.S. bombers, as well as relics in our oceans are very common parts of our experience and our lives. Um, you see the military and their presence in parades, um, and there's very high levels of patriotism that is secondary to the colonization, not just of our land, but of our minds. Um, you see high enlistment rates, among our youth that is largely connected to the fact that economically we are not, we don't fare very well. And so the US military provides opportunity for many people to be able to pull themselves out of poverty. Um, and in, in addition to that, there's so many different layers of environmental degradation. And so, for example, one of the mesas in the North referred to as Anderson Air Force Base, it alone has almost a hundred toxic, uh, toxic sites uh, in addition to that, on the island, there's over 19 Superfund sites, and Superfund sites are the U.S. Um, Environmental Protection Agency's program 
that identifies the most toxic sites in the country um, in an effort to be able to remediate and to um, fix, if you will, or to clean those lands. And in addition to the toxicity that is contained therein, as part of the land dispossession, also is the destruction of cultural resources and artifacts with continued base development. And so we see this, um, as you can see here, this call to action. We had a protest just about two weeks ago um, because there was the clearing of ancient uh, Ladis visit, uh, villages and roughly 10 that were contained therein. And as part of the US uh, process of uh, review, which is referred to as the NEPA process, there's, it's a prescribed process. And what has happened on our island is that they've already begun the clearing and the construction even without having completed and fulfilled uh, the process of, uh, or of the NEPA review process. Um, this slide shares uh, clear concrete figures in terms of the loss of life of people who are based in Guam and in our neighboring uh, Micronesian islands. Um, and so, as you can see in the, in the box, lives lost, the death rate of troops from Guahan and other U.S. Micronesian islands during service in Afghanistan and Iraq is higher than that of any other jurisdiction. And so, as you can see, this is the rate uh, per 1,000, 1, I'm sorry, per 100,000 inhabitants. And so, you see Guam's rate is at 5.8 in comparison to the U.S. average rate of 1.44 and in comparison to other states. Uh, with the highest next, the next highest state being Virginia at 1.66. So clearly our children um, are not only participating in the U.S. war machine, but dying because of the high uh, proportionate rates of enlistment, we also are dying at the highest rates. And so these are some of the faces of who, the who in terms of the deaths. And so as we visit the questions that were posed for our discussion today, and we look at uh, the landscape. What is the moment? What is this moment telling you at the most foundational levels of existence? Um, I think in this time of COVID and this time of, of social distancing and shutdown in so many ways, um, the larger natural order of things in so many ways is hitting a reset button. Um, we know that the planet is healing. And we see this with different indicators of global climate change, which, of course, for us in the Pacific, as with HEMA, you know, we are being, um, climate change is huge, huge threat, especially to the sinking islands in Micronesia. Um, and so as part of that reset, people are demanding justice. You know, we see this with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and secondary to all of the changes, there's, you see kind gestures of love in the world that are beginning to come back and to bring back uh, sort of the pulse of humanity. And so when we move on to the question of yearnings, what is tugging at your heart and spirit at this particular moment, both personal and political? I think as members of humanity, we really are all called to love. And as part of that loving is to deliver and to rise to the reset that is the pandemic. You know, even in my own life, I'm constantly reflecting of, geez, there's so many beautiful things that have come out of this process. How do we keep that and not return to, you know, what was considered the normal, which in so many ways was absent of humanity. And so this is an opportunity for an overhaul for us to participate in intentionally creating a world in you. And part of what um, I like to see in that regard, of course, is looking at issues of not national security, but of genuine security and human security and providing for our communities their needs. Um, and part of the shift in terms of militarism is to look at and to visualize and imagine what an economy for peace could possibly look like. And for us in the Marianas in, in Guahan, that's a very important conversation piece because oftentimes military presence is justified because of the economic contributions that are made by the U.S. military and Department of Defense. And so moving on to the third element of looking at imaginings, what must a feminist future look like, include, and demand if you truly accept answers to the two previous questions? What values would be the foundation of your vision? And so for in response to this question, as you can see on the slide, I defer to Ihagan from Malawan Guahan, which is our organization. Um, our organization has, is in part of its establishment, and we're very new, we're actually even less than a year old, 
um, we've identified some very core traditional Chamorro values that guide how we engage our work and how we engage each other. And so the first of which is a value that uh, in our language is called Finat Tautau. And Finat Tautau is this concept of having, it, it's similar to the Western concept of respect, but that is only sort of the surface superficial uh, interpretation of this concept. Because for us, it's about bowing to the spirit of each person in humanity. And so it's this deep sense of respect for humanity, but not just for people, but also for the planet. Um, so there, this engages not just a return to each other, but also a return to the tunnel, to the land, the land which has sustained us in our existence uh, for millennia. A second value is guinaiza, which is love, and that goes without explanation. And then the third, in terms of imagining, and we're seeing a lot of this not only on our island, but throughout the world, is a return to the land that has always taken care of and sustained us. And so this issue or this idea of sustainability and spiritual connection for us is very critical and key. And so with Ihagan from Malawan, uh, just over the weekend, we did a seed distribution program where we distributed home gardening kits to families um, through the networks of the women in those homes um, so that we can return and be empowered in the idea that we can take care of our kids. And as much as these colonial, larger colonial arrangements exist and are very inhibiting and what have you, that we still can empower ourselves in the context of that colonization to find our peace and to find our own power. Um, and so not just with the gardening kits, but also with our traditional medicines. And so I want to take pause to look at our logo. And so you see this woman um, who's part of our logo and every single scribble in that image was intentional for us. And so you see um, on her headband and on her head are the different phases of the moon, because traditionally we follow the 13 lunar uh, phases of the moon in the lunar calendar. And so that is a reminder to us of our connection with time, with nature. And um, you see in this image as well, these particular fern leaves that is what we use for our traditional medicines. You see the Gasali flower, which is endemic to our, our region and that brings healing to our bodies. And you see in the weave of her hair, um, the way in which women are woven together in the way that we, um, much like in the catching of fish, um, which is very significant for us culturally, that through our cooperation and working together that we're able to accomplish most things. Um, and so moving on to the fourth element, and that is the doing, what is being done now that supports realizing your vision? What else will we need to be doing with whom and how? Um, and so I have a picture here of a recent protest um, that we did because there was some sexual assault happening in our community. And so of course we took a stand. This is just some of our members in that larger protest. And so as part of the doing, you know, we have, we, I can give you a list of very tangible things, but, in, but of course the undergirding thing and that's really key is the education, not just of our women, but of our girls and rising to the occasion of mentoring, you know, so that whatever wisdom is captured in our cultural, not just history, but in our cultural sense of self, that we are able to transmit that to protect and inoculate our girls as they move into their womanhood. Um, so mentorship for us is really key. And collaboration that comes coupled with intersectionality. Because while we, you know, um, one thing I haven't shared is that, and perhaps very contrastingly with, um, with Baya and with Sima, um, in the Mariana Islands, we are a traditional matriarchal, matrilineal, matricentric society. And so women actually traditionally play a very significant role. As a matter of fact, in our ancient times, we even had the designation of female chiefs um, who complemented the role of the male chiefs in the clan. And so for us, this sense of power and uh, partnership with men is something that we actually need to be reminded to bring them along. Um, and so while we focus on girls, we focus on our women, we also can't forget to bring the men along. Um, and what's signature to our cultural practice is the complementarity in the relationship between men and women, not the dominance of one over the other, but rather the partnership with each other to be able to, um, to, be able to realize 
the most healthiest in terms of our community and strength and what have you. And so uh, we women in Ihadam from Malawan, I mean, to begin with, culturally, we're an empowered group. And so we um, empower ourselves with our girls in various uh, different ways and are really just trying to bring us back to the power of the traditional sense of who we are. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And it seems, you know, one of the things I'm taking from your presentation is part of the decolon decolonizing project is also, um, it's a memory project. It's, it's remembering, right? Remembering uh, the, the, the traditional ways that um, were the, the life affirming ways, for example. And I'm thinking also about you know, this whole question of the difference between knowledge and wisdom. There's a lot of information out there and a lot of people know about a lot of things, but I'm not sure how much wisdom we actually uh, have right? or we practice. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. And again, um, you know, everybody will get a chance to ask questions and so forth. Um, let's uh, hear um, next from uh, uh, Hema. And um, again, take a few moments just to reflect on your own reactions, uh, intellectual, emotional, what you're feeling in your body as you are uh, listening to our sister stories. Um, so Hema Wihongi, I hope that's the correct way to pronounce your family name, uh, is a Kaitiaki indigenous person is an environmental scientist, a Maori science scholar, and educator at the Unitech Institute of Technology in Auckland. She is co-founder of an ad hoc Maori network, Nga Kainawina, Hawaii, wow, 262. The network focused to advance why Kanaiwina, uh, the network focused to advance why 262 claims that considered who is entitled to make, make or participate in decisions affecting indigenous flora and fauna, the environment, Maori culture, and the products of Maori culture. Thank you so much for joining us. And it would be good to get a, a solid scientific view of things too. <laughs> and I'm sure it's not your, just your usual Western science. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me um, on here to speak. I'm Lisa Margo, and um, thank you so much for sharing the, the views of militarization, which um, um, fortunately um, we haven't had, uh, we haven't been affected so much, but um, I'm just so very honored to be on here to, to see so many women. Um, and I wanted to start first of all with a with a fairy 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 tale that um, I was brought up listening to, and it wasn't a traditional fairy tale, and it was a it's, it's a fairy tale. I don't know if people of um, uh, if women are familiar with the Jack and the Beanstalk story. So the story goes is that. Once upon a time, there was a young boy called Jack, and um, his mother was a, a drug addict. And um, so she sent Jack off to the market to sell the, the last cow, the, the last asset they had, which was the cow. And of course, he came back with some beans that someone had sold him. And the beans, um, of course, the, his mother was furious about and threw the beans outside. And of course, the next morning, there was this beanstalk. And so uh, Jack climbed up the beanstalk and he came into the land of the giants. And that in the giant's home, um, he noticed that there was an egg, uh, there, was a, there was a golden egg and there was a hen that was laying these golden eggs. So um, Jack stole the egg and escaped down the, the, the beanstalk and lived his life fairly well for a period of time. And then after that, um, Jack thought, I wonder what else is up there. So he went back up and he um, stole the, the, the gold. It was a harp, the golden harp. And um, 
Of course, the golden harp called out to the giant and says, look, um, um, come and save me. And um, Jack was able to escape down the beanstalk and then he cut the beanstalk down and, of course, killed the giant. So this is one of the stories that we've heard um, in our country and, and even as I was growing up. And to reframe that story, it's... Um, so no one ever asks, you know, well, what does the golden egg mean? The hen that lays the golden egg, and that's the assets of our people, of our of our ancestors. That's our land and our territories. No one's ever asked, well, what does the um, the golden harp mean? And the golden harp is, of course, the next thing that they take is our voices. And then, um, so what happened with the um, the beanstalk? How did they, with the giant? So what um, Jack did was cut down the beanstalk, but also cut our connection, our indigenous women's connection to our lands. No one has ever asked who supplied the beans. And I put to you that it's probably the churches and, you know, all respect to people that are, you know, religious. I don't mean to be dis disrespectful, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm telling the story. <laughs> and, of course, the other um, uh, other question was, well, what was his, what was the drug that his mother was um, uh, was on? And, um, and what was her name? And, of course, we call her Britannia. And Britannia was addicted to power and control. And so I was going to finish with that story, but I decided I thought it was probably a good way of um, understanding the the narratives, the, the fairy tales that um, continue the colonisation story. And um, that children believe that it's okay to go into other people's uh, territories to take their voices, to take their lands, to take their, their mana and their power. And it's okay to disconnect women from from the um, from our, our lands because the connection to the lands is also a connection that's been gifted to us from the heavens. Um, according to our people. So I, I really wanted to start with that and, and um, just something to think about. It's retelling those, those stories, those fairy tales. Now, just to jump over to, um, cross over to the, um, the, the, um, the COVID-19, we've actually, Māori have been um, exposed to approximately 70 different types of epidemics starting back in 1808. In 1808, when Captain Cook um, came across, our, I won't say discovered our, because we weren't lost, um, came across our country, um, the first uh, epidemic was uh, syphilis and gonorrhea. So our people suffered for five years um, because there wasn't any penicillin in those days. So a lot of our, our people died. The next major um, uh, next major um, epidemic was the um, 1918 to the 1920 20 Spanish flu, where um, nine times um, the rate of um, so um, there were nine times more um, Maori were died of that Spanish flu, and it was incidentally the. Um, what they found was that people, our people weren't dying from the Spanish flu as such, but they were dying from starvation because they had put up roadblocks to stop our people from going in to buy stores. And um, with the COVID-19, our, our smaller rural communities had put up roadblocks to stop people from coming in because we were vulnerable. And... Um, of course, um, that didn't go very well with um, the West, with the um, the local media here, and um, you know how dare they do this? But people don't remember the history, or or chose not to understand the history and how vulnerable Indigenous peoples are to epidemics. We also had the um, 1957 Hong Kong flu, which was um, which killed many of our people. Um, especially our children. Some of our, our children were born with um, birth defects because of that, missing limbs. Um, 
In 2009, we had the, the measles epidemic, um, which was 67% higher than um, non Māori. In 1913, so to go back, we had the smallpox epidemic. There were 100,000 um, vaccines that were sent to, um, to New Zealand and um, fewer than 20. So that these were the, the vaccines that um, weren't used were then issued to our people. So, um, you know, it makes me think again about the the fairy tales that the, the colonising fairy tales and, you know, it's okay to kill us. It's okay to, to take things from us. Um, so at present, um, of course, the, sorry, and the last thing was the swine flu in 2009. So the death rate was um, three times higher for Māori over 65 years of age. So um, that's just to give a small report and perspective on um, the power of, um, of um, pandemics and epidemics for our people in Aotearoa. Yes, we do have a we do have what seem what it seems like to to have a a fairly peaceful country, and we're fortunate being an island nation that um, we're able to close our borders a lot easier than other countries. But um, our Maori um, elders, the repositories of a lot of our um, our traditional knowledge. Uh, you know, are very vulnerable to um, to 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 all these um, these diseases that come from from non Maori, by the way. <laughs> and um, you know, it's time for a um, what what the COVID nineteen the lockdown has um, made us think about was that we need to have a societal reset. Um, and you know that we're no no longer happy to be just merely subjects of our country but to be um, true participants and partners and um, we need to be included in um, how and included in the shaping of our future. Um, there's, there's other commercial issues that have um, also, you know, we've got time to think about them is the duopoly that we have in our country. We have two major um, uh, um, food, food or um, supermarkets that um, actually, so there's, there's only two supermarkets that provide the food for, for our country that pack and ship them over. And so they, um, you know, in terms of how we, um, how we have more of an impact on and decisions, uh, make decisions on um, how the policies and legislation are, are, are dealt with. We also have to look at the interests the, um, of, of other countries. So, um, you know, when you've got two, you know, basically two um, supermarkets that supply our food, they also have quite a, um, an, a um, an impact on on um, how we can actually fight uh, fight uh, and and be more proactive in, in changing legislation. So, um, what I want to talk about now is the work that I've been doing in the far north, and it's um, it's quite innovative in in that it hasn't been done before and. I've been thinking very clearly about, and for many years, about how to empower our people in the in the um, rural communities to um, collectively work together. In the past, uh, government policies have been about um, funding individual um, or small groups of um, of um, people of communities. To um, work with restoration of the of the environment, they might be looking at uh, restoring uh, bird life or particular plant. And what they found out um, 
or what they they found out, I mean, the government found out was that a lot of those projects weren't working. And so um, what we've been doing over the past two years is looking at more of a landscape scale um, restoration restoration projects so that we we, we looked at these three contiguous um, forests up in the far north and so we were looking at how we can connect the people back to the land so in other words build that replant that beanstalk again so um, uh, one of the things that we've um, had to had to start to do, and I've been working. I'm a little bit tired because I've been four or five days up in the um, in the wilderness, basically, is using drones to to map the the environment. And drones are very good in in that we can get high resolution um, images. And um, so. So now we can go back to communities and to hapu, which are extended extended families, and say, "Well, this is what's on your block. These are these are the these are the characteristics of your plants. These are where all your um, medicinal plants are. This is where your the potential for um, for commercial." Um, um, projects can be made that this is the, the state of your waterways this is where your waterways are and um, when we've shown the uh, maps that we've um, been able to to uh, to develop from the the drone data um, many of our our elders um, have been very emotional and have cried because it's been the been many many years since they've been able to look at the land again. You know, some of them are elderly and they aren't able to walk on the land anymore. So this is one way of reconnecting our people and our, our um, youth back into the back to the environment so that they um, so that they and also to hear the stories that 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 our um, our, our our lands tell us. So um, I think that's been um, a, an important um, innovation that um, that hasn't really been done before, and um, in our country that is. And um, so it's about having the, uh, the 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 information to make this uh, prior informed consent on any challenges or any issues that the land might have um, that that um, that they um, the land may um, be telling us but um, what became more clear to me was the um, I was managed to over the six seven weeks that we were in uh, total lockdown was I had time to look at the Mātauranga or the traditional knowledge that was written in Māori and translated. Um, this was traditional knowledge that belongs to my mother uh, that was passed down to her. So it's thousands of years old. And what found, what, what I found um, fascinating was the, the story about our creation. And what we hear in schools um, today is that the cre our creation story was about um, the children, uh, that's the children of our Sky Father and our Earth Mother had uh, staged a coup to separate our parents, to separate them so that they would be able to have enlightenment and would be able to prosper. But when I went through the stories that my of my um, grand my mother and um, the ancient stories, actually that wasn't the case. The case was that the um, the father made the ultimate sacrifice, and he asked his his children to please separate his mother from um, uh, his Papatua uh, Nuki Earth Mother and himself, so that the children would prosper. So it was just that little, um, little bit of uh, that perspective that um, says, oh no, children are, um, 
uh, uh, you know, unruly, children are disobedient. And in fact, that wasn't the case. It was the story about sacrifice and the role of men to uh, to sacrifice what they need um, to do to protect um, his their children. And so it's stories have a incredible way of forming the behaviour of um, of people. And I think it's really important that you know. I guess this is me visioning about what can, what can that look like in the future. That it can look like well. The, the stories can tell, okay, you as a man, you as a woman, this is your role, this is your the behaviour that you know, we hope that you can emulate in the future. And so um, I thought that, um, you know, I would share a, a little bit of the, some of the thoughts that I've had, um, especially over lockdown, is just having the time to stop and think, which has been been wonderful for for um, a lot of people in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, it's because we've been on, on total lockdown, so um, it's meant that we didn't have to race around anywhere, go to meetings, attend anything else, but... Um, but to to start to think about okay what can I do to um, to ensure that I'm informed about my own stories about the the um, the types of um, protocols and behaviour that um, that's actually true to um, to my people but something that is been um, given to us by the land, by the land, the sky and the oceans. Um, so I've got a few different points that I, I, I really felt that um, may be useful to, to talk about. Um, the, the other, the last issue that I wanted to talk about that's been happening here is the issue around water. And um, we've, under our Treaty of Waitangi, which was signed in 18, um, 1840, we were guaranteed on um, in an Article 2 of the Treaty, of Te Tiriti, exclusive and undisturbed rights to our flora, fauna, our taonga, taonga Māori. So that included our language um, our, and, um, and our cultural heritage. And so the water is has been uh, the water claim that we have Māori have been um, fighting for for the past, or oh, approximately five six years now, has come to the the High Court now. So we, we've been we've gone through a process of looking at um, the evidence from different um, iwis or people or, or tribes in our country and now the recommendation was that we go to the the high court um, the issue the, the 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 real issue here is that Auckland is our major city so um, we've the, we've got um, the largest population here but that means also the water usage is high here and they've uh, the local councils and government have um, decided that they would have to negotiate with another tribe which actually owns a, a fresh water river and negotiate terms and um, the 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 tribe is called Tainui and they requested that 20 million dollars a day be paid for the use of um, tapping into water from their river and it was the Waikato River and um, of course there was a huge white lash about that of course there's a huge backlash about um, you know who do they think you know no one owns the water and that's uh, so that's the, that's the the government's um, uh, previous government's stand has, has always been on oh, no one owns the water no one owns the air but uh, you know they've completely disregarded the Te Tiriti and this is fortunately we've been able to um, to call them on this to say well that, that's this is not good enough this is what we're guaranteed now it's not so much the issue of Twenty million dollars a day. It's the behaviour of um, of of um, 
water and and um, so the the usage of water in our cities. You know, we have people here that um, think that water is um, is free because that's again another the, the narrative from the government that um, they have a, a right to use it, that they have a right to waste it, and um, and they do. And so, um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, when there's no consequence to uh, to the, the mismanagement and misuse of water, that of course affects our people. One of our um, one of our pakatoki is you know is um, you know I am the water, the water is me. I am the land, the land is me. And so when we speak like that we're talking about our um our whakatoki or our, our pepeha and um so my pepeha to finish is uh ko putai te maunga so putai is my mountain ko wairoro te awa wairoro is my river ko o mapere taku roto lake o mapere is my lake ko kaikwe te whenua uh, ko napui te iwi and ko mata to te waka. Um, no reira, um, thank you so much for again for this opportunity. And so these are so little bits of cultural um, containers that um, I, I hope that uh, will be useful and um, and hopefully thought provoking. So tēnā koutou, kia ora tāte katoa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I was, as I was listening to you, um, I thought about the creation story, right? And uh, who gets to tell your people's crea creation story, right? And it seems to me that's a really fundamental question, right? But that's a very different worldview than just thinking about, you know, just straight kind of a lineage, right, in, in the conventional way of, um, and so I was wondering, and I know, Faiha, you've talked, you mentioned this in your um, biography, is who gets to tell the stories of the peoples whose stories are hardly ever told? and hardly ever known by anybody outside, you know, uh, that, that group or that community, right? And to put it more directly to all of you here, who, who tells your stories, right? And maybe even before that, who are your people? Marga, can I, can I just please, I just um, put this other story in which is, absolutely beautiful was the the story of um, again our sky father and our earth mother and of course our earth mother was the second wife the first wife was um pokoharu at the poor so she came from the night from the from uh, before the world had light and the first child was hanui orangi which was female she was the eldest of um, all the the atua, the gods of um, of our lands, and that's a, that's quite a profound um, story to, to or, or 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 lineage, because it talked about the first voice um, of our people and that and that story, which is never the story is not told in schools. Um, not even not many of our own people know this 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 lineage. But it's important to know that our voices, as um, as descendants of this, um, the first ancestress, which was the oldest ancestor, um, was female, mm -hmm. and she brought the, um, of course, and she was the wind, and she was so she was older than her, when Tafiri Mati, which is the, her brother. And um, but she's the first voice that's that's heard, and again, it's about our women's voices, and that when we're speaking, we're actually speaking on behalf 
um, of our ancestress. We speak in um, uh, her, her voice, her story, being the wind which covers all the land, which covers, um, which sees everything, which goes all around the world. Um, that's, our, that's our voices that uh, we have an obligation to emulate. Oh, thank you. It's such a different worldview, you know, than uh, many of us are, are used to. Um, and I think part of the colonial project, right, part of co colonization is changing the story so that the firstborn is usually becomes the man, right? Or presented as the man and the second born is the woman. Or part of colonization is also making us forget. Making us forget where we came from, who are our people, our connections to the land and all the elements. Uh, and I was also thinking in relation to all the four presentations, you know, this idea that land and water are life. Without those, there is no life. And how do we reach and get in, you know, right relations with the land when the land is occupied, militarized? Um, and so these are deep philosophical, spiritual, and material questions, aren't they? So let's um, open it up for uh, general questions. Um, and uh, let's, yeah, if you have a question, please put it in the chat box or put it in the Q&A section. Uh, there was a uh, uh, question from uh, Gayatri Muthari from Indonesia, who was asking specifically about um, uh, specifically to advocate women and girls in Indonesia who do not wear and who do not want to wear hijab or not uh, or or not wearing anymore. I would like to know if there has been research or investigation on the effect uh, of uh, wearing or not wearing. I guess wearing a hijab um, because of the uh, forced burqa and niqab in Afghanistan. And she, uh, she says, what I know is only the World Bank report in 2014 that 95% of the people who wear those, the women who wear those, has a deficiency of vitamin D. That seems like a very technical question. Um, so um, Seema, if you want to answer that, I think it's really important since we have this these four fantastic presenters um, to, you know, raise questions um, that we can't easily find answers to. The philosophical questions, the spiritual questions, the political questions that are not reported. So um, uh, let's, let's talk about those. Other questions and do any of the panelists have responses to what you've heard from each other? I can chime in, um, Margot, with the, the question that you raised earlier in terms of who's telling the stories. And so we know with Western education, we know with the introduction of patriarchy, that clearly oftentimes that's from the male perspective, the male colonizer white perspective, but at least from, from our uh, positionality. Um, and so I think for us, it's really important to recognize um, not only the fostering and facilitation of finding voice, but using it, elevating it, and rewriting those stories, retelling those stories, and reclaiming those parts of ourselves. You know, and for us in a very almost common sense way <laughs> in terms of how do we, you know, addressing the question of how do we return to the land, you know, as we sit here, my son is sending me pictures on his, on my phone of him, you know, developing a new vegetable garden in the backyard. You know, I, I think sometimes we, we um, make things far more complicated than they really need to be. 
you know, life, um, you know, when we identify what the basics are and where we need to be, I mean, we just move in that direction, you know, and reclaim our lives on our own terms. And that for us, you know, we, we on Guahan are up against the big giant, right? The big American giant. We've been on the list of non-self-governing territories in the United Nations since 1960 when the list was established, and we remain one of the last 17 in the globe. You know, most people don't even know we still exist as, you know, as traditional classic colonies, what we do. And so living that generation after generation has really forced us to imagine freedom, mm. you know, and what that could look like in this very heavy colonial construct, right? And so um, I think for us, you know, that's why the return to the land, reclaiming our stories and rewriting even the history you know, my history friends remind me that history is not linear. You know, that's a hard concept to imagine, but it's not linear, right? I mean, we can rewind it, retell it, and reclaim it. Mm -hmm. I think, um, uh, Faiha, you have a comment, please. Yes, um, just to connect to the same issue, uh, I'd like to uh, make a note that it's very important. I think that uh, telling stories is a very important tool of resilience and resistance uh, as we, uh, uh, for us as women and all, I think for all uh, people uh, who are marginalized, all, all uh, uh, marginalized groups. So uh, I think this is also related to history uh, and the question, the big question, who, write, who is writing history and who is making history? Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, who, who makes history, those who are making history are women and men and people, people yani, from all kinds and from all, uh, from the nation. And those who are writing history are those who are in power mm -hmm. and mainly they are men. So it's very important here that to, to uh, tell the stories from women perspective, and from uh, how they uh, they see things and also not only from women also from marginalized groups because they all uh, make history so yes. so this is very important and it's very uh, Im uh, it's very important tool and empowering tool uh, uh, writing writing stories then it is writing history writing history social history so it's very important to write social history because uh, in this case, in, uh, by this, uh, to, uh, using this tool, we are uh, adding to what is written in history. Mm -hmm. That's very And, important. you know, to extend that point, Faiha, that the writing is one form of documentation. And if we think about what are all the ways that people's real histories and real stories can be documented, you know, through artwork, tapestry. I know that of Palestinian course. women have a long history of um, yeah. telling their stories through the traditional dresses and the traditional embroidery, right? And so, songs. songs. Yes, Can I? exactly. Art, art in all its shapes. Yes, all, exactly. all kinds of arts. Right. Yeah. So multi, I guess you'd say multimedia in this today's context, but multiple ways to tell stories. I think yes. is important. Yeah. Can I um, other yes? Please. Can I answer the question? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, on the uh, hijab and um, uh, the, the the problem that we may, women face with lack of vitamin C, and not only vitamin C, but also calcium as well. It's it has not been documented, but. And 99% of women in Afghanistan, for example, do suffer from osteomalacia and uh, pain on their, uh, on their bones, I would say, because of their, uh, not only the hijab, but they are not allowed to expose uh, themselves. With hijab, I mean, uh, they even have to cover their face and hands also in order to not to be seen, not to be shown to the sun. Uh, that's why I think uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of cases. You ask any woman in this country, they suffer from uh, particularly lower back pain and uh, pains on their leg. 
so it does require a proper uh, deep uh, research because we need to go to the places and do it and nobody is interested actually to to do that unfortunately or even in the the people in the public health are not willing to do because they might be opposed by some of the religious leaders mm -hmm. so they only want to keep their uh, political position mm -hmm. this <clears throat> my second comment or um, answer to the question as uh, fai has said uh, in our country, who writes the history, it's always men and uh, the people who are in power. And usually the history is not the, the uh, reality in the country. It's according to the king's wish, uh, what they wrote. But I think with technology, I have to say that the recent 10 or 20 years, uh, it is much better because most of the things are documented by our mobile phone. So they cannot, I, I, in one of my interview, I said that the history in this time will not be according to the order of the Sultan, the king. Uh, they didn't like it. They were very angry at me. That's why I criticized them. But I think that is uh, something good. But again, we have all these documentation, but somebody has to write it honestly, mm -hmm. impartially. And that could be women, actually, all over. Thank you. Yes, and, and, you know, you talked about impartiality. And I wonder if there's actually such a thing as being impartial, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, how do you tell the story and say, this is our perspective, own up to it? Because many times we're told that the official story is impartial. The official mm -hmm. story is neutral. Well, you know, we know that's the farthest thing from the truth. Yeah. Um, other questions, comments? Uh, I think we're facing the similar situation here of removing, muting, and all of that. What are your reactions? And um, if the panelists also want to react to each other, Right, so um, how does indigenous people struggles, you know, relate with um, uh, struggles in Afghanistan and, and Palestine? And does it mean that there, you know, who would be considered indigenous, you know, in both of those places? And is, indig is indigenous even uh, a relevant concept, right? So just, you know, thinking about uh, those questions, I think are are important too. Right. Yes, Sima. Um, well, I think we um, we see this kind of uh, occupation or um, discrimination in uh, all over uh, the world. In in Afghanistan, for example. Even the Buddhas, which was standing for 2,000 years, was destroyed because their faces were looked like the original people of Bamiyan, the Hazaras, more the Asian style of, uh, of faces. Um, first, I don't know how many years ago they cut the face of the Buddha. If you look at the uh, photo when they were existing, the face was cut because it was Asian. I mean, it was flat. Mm -hmm say flat A uh, faces. So the original people who lives in Bamiyan looks like that, or the central part of Afghanistan. Um, so those, we all face in different ways uh, of occupation and have the history. But I think uh, the good part is that this, I mean, they are sister from that the island I never heard of that. Uh, I'm so glad that I was part of this program to to hear what is going on, and and I, I'm also say I have to say that I'm sorry that they lost their people, their young men and brothers in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so it's it's good to learn and to know 
although I, I personally say that uh, when the other day they were talking about heroes in China, that the Chinese government is not treating them well. But I said, who should tell the Pompeo and the, his boss that the, the real American, let's say the, now the Native American, what they call it, how, how they were all treated in your country. So nobody is there to, to ask them that, how they are treating. I think the best, as far as I know, I think the, the New Zealand is maybe the good example. I, I'm not sure if it's a good example. But look at Australia, or look at Canada with all these countries, how they treat the original mm-hmm. uh, o- owner of that land. Exactly. So I think there's an co- occupation of uh, most of our countries by different uh, people of race, maybe, or religion. Mm-hmm. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Rose, Carla, uh, Gabi, any of you want to respond to things that have been said? And I'm calling their names because they're part of the Peace Women Across the Globe uh, team. Hello. Thank you, Margot. Yes, Rose. Thank you, uh, the speakers of today. It's been a really wonderful session of listening to these beautiful ladies to speak about the history, and uh, especially in Afghanistan, Palestine, and to know about what they've been going through, the challenges that have been there for so long. Pray and hope that uh, things will change and become a little bit better for these two, two countries in the world. Also, thank you. I did not know there's a country called Guham. I learned it about it today, and they have great stories. So really, I want probably if Lisa can share the, the slides with us so that we can continue learning and probably just finding out more about this great country. Also for Hema, I like the way she started uh, the presentation with the story of Jack and been and really brought it out so well for people to understand. It's been a beautiful session. Um, thank you, Margo, also for a beautiful moderating work. You've done a great job. We are very proud to have you uh, as one of us, the Peace Women Across the Globe. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Rose. And, um, you know, while Rose uh, just spoke, Rose is uh, from Kenya. And I think it's important to connect the, the latest um, U.S. military command called AFRICOM, right, Africa Command, as the latest outpost of the U.S. military. And, mm-hmm. you know, with that in place, the U.S. military controls every they have an installation or a base on every continent uh, on this on this planet. Yeah, uh, over seven hundred uh, plus, uh, mm-hmm. and also Sima was talking about budgets. Um, I think the worldwide spending on military is about four billion dollars a day, uh, maybe mm-hmm. five, and the U.S. spends two and a half a day of that. Right? Mm-hmm. Imagine what could happen even with just one day of uh, worldwide military spending and what um, that money could be used for. So just to put things in perspective, how many masks, if that's the thing we need, or how many, you know, test kits could $5 billion a a day per, you know, um, uh, get us. So again, thinking about um, the reach and scope of, the situations that we're facing. It, I, have, I have two questions to Faiha and to the other um, panelists. How the stories are going to, for example, in Palestine to, the, to, to Israel, so that 
peace could could be or stories could um, connect to peace or to peace um, half this I don't know and the second is I'm yes, not understanding I, I the first question. My, my, my question is how the stories go to that that the people, the neighbor people who are not in the, the occupators also knows the stories and can perhaps understand better the situation they destroy every day. Uh, it's a good, good question, Gabby. Uh, it is very important to uh, write a Palestinian narrative from those who witnessed what happened since 1948. And it's very important to translate these stories in order to uh, let people know more about what happened. Because the more they know, you know, sometimes they take another side and know the real story. Because, you know, in the first place, from the beginning, uh, the, the Zionist used a narrative, the narrative Zionist, the, the, the Zionist narrative, that said, said that we came to a, to a land without people, for people who need land. And this is a very uh, a slogan that they uh, talked much much about it and and uh, uh, said said it in different ways. And our story, the Palestinian story, it proves that they came to a land with people. The land, the people, they were there. And the more that you document what happened to the people and how how they were living. A, a, a cultural and beautiful life that, you, that they were living in Palestine before 1948, and what happened, and what what kind of life they lived, and and all stories that sometimes it affects those who re read it, and especially if it is documented from those who witnessed the events, not not because of you know some just slogans or something. So um, I think it's very well known that. If you historians, Israeli historians, they changed all their concept and and and, and opinion, uh, like the famous uh, famous uh, historian Elan Pape, who is who who started to be uh, a Zionist and uh, from a Zionist family, and then he started to be against the Zionism and uh, wrote a very important uh, book about the ethnic cleansing in Palestine. So the more we document. The more we write our stories uh, from our our uh, uh, interview, from our concept, from our uh, um, uh, you know, from from us as uh, uh, you know Palestinians, the more that we can affect the uh, you know the societies, all 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 societies on Earth, and of course we can affect the Israeli uh, uh, citizens and those who are, you know, just repeating, repeating the narrative, the, the false narrative, uh, uh, the Zionist false narratives, especially in schools and everywhere, because the narrative now in schools, they are raising children, uh, uh, you know, full of hatred. And how can we return this to the original? We are, we are not demanding something, you know, impossible. We are demanding our right, our self-determination, a, a state that it's viable. You know, it, it, it's not fragmented. It's a state that we can live in sovereignty and, and, and live, live, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a life to build our, our future. So it is very important, this uh, 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 documenting stories that you are asking about documenting stories and how ca can it affect you know, uh, those in, in, in uh, you know, sometimes it is very difficult to, uh, to affect those who are in power or in the government, maybe, but it affects people. And people are very important. You know that there are many women who are also with Palestinian, uh, uh, Palestinian people and they are uh, uh, making like marches with the Palestinian 
they are from the Israeli community, and they are uh, they are uh, you know showing solidarity with Palestinian women, and they know, and they are sometimes they are just uh, documenting also what is happening and talk about it in media and between you know uh, uh, in, in all uh, kind of uh, information uh, tools. So. I don't know if it is enough for your question, but I'm ready to answer if there is something else. Yes, and, and I want to also go, uh, have us think in a, in a little bit deeper way, right? As we mentioned in the beginning, we're in a very uh, crucial moment in, on so many fronts. So much of what's happening is irrational. The policies are irrational. Um, the plans that are in place are irrational, right? And I think as activists, we assume a certain kind of rationality, right? So how do we need to think about confronting irrationality with rationality when people are, it's deeply emotional, right? Uh, and so when we're trying to change the minds and hearts, uh, well, first of all, whose minds and hearts are we trying to change when we're trying to decolonize, right? And how do we, how do, how do we think that happens is, is another question uh, to, to really think about. And I think as activists, we, we assume a kind of a rational, you know, rationality, right? And so how... Because it seems the, uh, the fundamentalists of all kinds, um, the who, you know, people who really are destroying life have a way of attaching themselves to some deep things about people. And so they have a certain kind of influence that only using rational methods doesn't, you know, get us... Um, in the uh, doesn't attract people in the same way. In other words, that's why the question of yearning is even in this format, right? Mm -hmm. What are the deepest yearnings that people have that makes us do things that may be rational, it may not be rational, but it, you know, um, puts us in certain directions uh, regarding our behaviors. So that's just a question that you know, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, as somebody trying to be on the force of uh, helping, you know, preserve life and all of that. Is there <laughs> anyone else uh, who would like to speak who hasn't had a chance? Oh, Either yeah. from our, um, okay, Anne-Marie, yes, please. please. I listened very carefully because I'm interested in the ways how stories are told. But still, I have a question there, because we can also uh, watch how stories are kind of commodified and uh, exoticized, folklorized, and then sold on the market. So how can we as feminists be aware of this process of colportation, of kind of capturing our stories and give them more space to maintain the variety and the living aspects they actually should should take with when when they are told nowadays i think there's no original stories the original stories are re-originalized all the time by being told by different people so i'm not really sure how to handle this uh, this uh, uh, challenge in a way about what to do with stories well, I think it's really important, though, to make a distinction about who's telling the story. It's one thing for the people to tell and retell their story. It's a whole nother project when the stories are being co-opted and commodified, right? So I think it's important to make that, that distinction. Right. And thank you, Rebecca, for the comment about uh, uh, Welsh people being indigenous to... Um, to where you're located, right? Um, so what about this question of stories? How do we deal with the commodification? Is that something that we should even pay attention to? Yes, I think so. 
because yeah. you know how how can you uh, differentiate between a false story and true story this is a very good question mm -hmm. because i think it's very important that when you collect a story you, you, a story or collect stories you know here it comes it has to be according to uh, a methodology which is i i believe that oral history methodology will be a very good uh, of a very good benefit in this regard because oral history methodology uh, teach us as a methodology that we need to make comparison between the narratives that we document it's not only to document uh, and and to write even you document everything but when you write as a researcher you need a researcher uh, that that can comp uh, compare between the the, the stories and and uh, according to the to a scientific uh, uh, methodology so this is very important because it is like you know you can't just uh, consider any story is true you know so it's very important to 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 uh, and i believe that it's not only uh, uh, by adopting uh, oral history methodology also a feminist approach to oral history also the feminist approach that i adopt uh, personally when i document uh, stories and document uh, yeah women women's stories and also uh, indigenous and and uh, marginalized people stories okay go ahead rebecca Please. Yeah, I just um, be, because you mentioned the, the 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 comment that I put in the chat, I just wanted to just say briefly about the context of it because it, what I was trying to say was uh, uh, that the uh, term indigenous in the racist context of, for example, um, British racism uh, today has now very unfortunately, but we need to be aware of how this happens, has been mobilized, indeed weaponized by white racists within Britain as um, uh, part of their, I mean, it came up particularly in Brexit, but it's been used against uh, a number of, of minoritized communities who you know, live here, many of whom are part of that toxic British empire, but are part of Britain now. And that, yes, it's true that my Welsh ancestors were the indigenous people, but now we there is a real complexity about using that word uh, because it has been mobilized by racists. And I'm just, I just wanted to contribute that Great. recognition that you know the term can also be used for um uh, toxic and racist purposes in certain uh european countries particularly well look we're in a political struggle right whatever we do there's going to be resistance right oh. and so that shouldn't stop us any group of people from doing what they believe is the right thing and you know um, that's right and can uh, i share one piece of really good news that we just i just came through on twitter that some of you may be aware of the slave owner slave um uh trader uh, edward colston uh whose statue in bristol where i went to university was brought down by um black lives matter protesters and overnight, just last night, a statue has been put up on exactly that plinth. And it is of Jen, I think her last name was Wilson, but it's, it was one of the Black Lives Matter protesters who climbed on top of the empty plinth after Edward Colston, the slave owner, had been dumped into the water uh, with her arm triumphantly up. And there's a new statue on that plinth of her. And I think that this is also something uh, we can always be changing our narratives and she and others have and a sculptor has made that visible so i just wanted to share that because that's a powerful piece of good news for us mm -hmm. and to even challenge that point right how is replacing one statue with another statue changing the underlying worldview that says there's a, a heroic figure, 
that you of know, course, does it, everything. It doesn't, yeah. but yeah. it was at least a yeah. woman and it was, um, it was symbolic. Okay. I agree with you. I think there are other kinds of, st of, yeah. t of, of stories for us to share and for, uh, you know, an analyses about the whole notion of these monuments. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Let's not go into to this one in too much detail. Um, I'm, uh, be, uh, Kinchi, please go ahead. And then uh, I'd like to give uh, our speakers the final kind of uh, comments. And yes. um, go ahead, Kinchi. Yes. Okay. So I think that this is the whole question about what is, what is civilized and what is not civilized. So if we look at all the ancient, what we call these five or six ancient civilizations, they were all the agricultural societies uh, on the riverbanks, so that's the Amazon, the Nile, the uh, etc. But then all these societies, now all these civilizations now are seen as backward and as seen as uh, well, backward. And so that's also a, a synonym for bar barbaric, barbarism. Whereas on the other hand, the very barbaric act of plunder and genocide by the colonizers is now, they are now being re uh, represented as the, well, the best of the civilization uh, because they are the, they represent progress, development and being modern. So I think um, here we are talking about the, the colonization of the mind, where it is not only um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the colonizers that, have, that, that look at it like this, there's the uh, self-orientalism, the kind of uh, self-degradation degradation that we also see. So uh, I think uh, Sami Amin wrote a very beautiful book called Eurocentrism. And actually, he was also the one to coin that, uh, that term. And I think um, he went into the history of how uh, that kind of, uh, there was the stitching of uh, different periods so that the current so-called advanced Western civilization is based so that they can put a link to the Greek episode, the, the, et cetera. I think um, well, I, I would recommend that book. And then one last point is um, now under all these um, powerful um, currents of so-called uh, being modern, etc. The we don't some, very often we do, we also look down on our own traditions, on our own um, uh, well uh, 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 practices. So, for example, in China, there has always been the call to say we should respect the Chinese medicine, and even during this pandemic when the Chinese medicine has demonstrated its effectiveness in healing a lot of people, especially at the earlier stages, then there is still the, the, the general belief that Western medicine is better than Chinese medicine. And so I think um, this is a, a battle we have to fight. And, uh, and I agree very much that we should be telling stories, but then it's also to also have um, a, a critical look at the kind of uh, colonizing of the mind. Oh, and the heart. Mm. Nadia, go ahead. We only have just a um, So in these last comments, no more analysis, please. If you're going to speak, please talk about what's the value, right, that you want to carry forward. What are the important values that have to do with decolonization, that have to do with transformation. I think we've had enough analysis and I want us to, for the session, I don't mean for the whole topic, but let us move towards thinking about if we truly want to decolonize, what are the values that we really need to say are the most fundamental and what are the principles uh, that we need to say are most fundamental? So, um, uh, Nadia, go ahead. I think we need to, to look into like women's interventions in, in, in the change we need to do in, in changing values and how we're, make, how, how we're living in more just offering our voices. Like we're just speaking out or reflecting on history, but we're not making a real change into how the world is being run. And, and this takes so me what's also your to principle? The... What's your principle that you would say is important? We're not talking right now about methodology just yet. 
And what do you think is the I, most life affirming values that we should all really say these are the core values of a society we're trying to create? It should be a more of matriarchal set of values, not patriarchal. That's the core problem we're living in. We're living in a dominated patriarchal what structure. Would, what would be an example it. of that? What would be an example? Please, uh, no more, the, no more analysis. Let's try to think. About I would see the the wind, the mother wind uh, example as 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 a real thing of living, not just like a notion. Like okay. one of the participants gave this, and I just thought that, like, we need to 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 make our lives a living reality, not a spiritual one only, or a dreamt life, or once upon a life like kind of living to women. And Great. Uh, thank you. I'm going to cut you off. Sorry, Nadia, okay. because I want to make sure other people, also our panelists, especially. Uh, would, uh, answering that question, what would be core values that you would like us to carry forward? Values and principles that would counter colonization, whether it's of the land, of our hearts, our minds. Right. So um, let's start with Hema. Uh, the, I think the value value for me I think the very important value is to um, is, is what we call whakapapa or genealogy and I think that when you when for me uh, when I know that I'm just one in the line of, of women and I'll just quickly give you this um, this experience that I had uh, was when my my mother passed away and um, there was a, a cry that came from my heart that I never knew was there and it, it surprised me and it was sort of like this portal opened and that 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 voice came through me but not from me okay. and I realized then that's the importance of knowing who you are who your family are where they've come from thank and you. that that's what you're bringing thank you so genealogy and yeah. the continuity right um Baiha, what would be one value or one principle that you think is most uh, important or among I the most important? Yeah, I will not repeat what is, was said. I, I, I believe that I can add respect diversity. Okay. It's very important to respect diversity in okay, order thank to, you. Go, go, to go forward. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Seema? I, I would say that not only respect, but accept diversity. Because that is the reality that we live in. Okay. And Lisa. For me, it would be empowerment. Because colonization results in total loss of power. So it's regaining that power within yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, any other ones that you have a chance to, you know, throw in a couple more? I limited one because I was worried about the time, but if you have another burning one, that's great. And uh, those of you who are in the audience, um, uh, it, it's really, please put your um, uh, opinion in the chats as well. What I'm uh, doing is saving the chat so we can, you know, come up with some principles out of the, these two two days of uh, feminist thinking. Anything else? This just, two, just two things as uh, guardianship, whether it's your, your family or your environment, and we'll say to bring up what Lisa said, and that's love. You know, love for yourself and, and love for the situation, good or bad. And those of you who are uh, in the audience, so to speak, please uh, put your uh, values there as well. Humility, Cora uh, Fabro says. Respect. Respect. Yeah. I think we have a good list going. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I'm just 
I've been lucky because I've been at all the um, the sessions, and I've seen across all of them uh, these these uh, qualities that you've listed. Um, I've heard from people the connections to the land. Um, heard from people about what happens when they are not recognized in all the ways they may not be recognized. Uh, and that's a, a, a very particular kind of violence, right? Um, and so it seems to me that a couple of things have come out of this session for me is how do we really think about resources, you know, um, in, in the most complex ways. Uh, and uh, the other through line is absolutely the connection to, to the land, right? And water and all the natural resources and, and to, you know, um, the, the sacred that isn't just institutionalized religion, right? But there are real things about the worlds we live in that truly are sacred. And so how must we think about that? Uh, and the question of stories, right? Uh, and who gets to tell the stories? And this idea about the master narrative that's supposed to tell the truth about uh, human existence, I think has been challenged certainly by this group, but uh, by many others along the way. Um, connectivity and sharing of success stories, right? Um, uh, must be willing to listen to what difference says and should implement the freedom of speech, right? Uh, and, you know, with every acts of freedom also come responsibilities, right? So it's not just that we get to say anything we want. For what are, should we be responsible and to whom should we be accountable? I think also are really important questions. Right? Uh, anything else? To ourselves. And responsibility to ourselves and accountable and to ourselves. Yes, exactly. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I'm going to do something unconventional, except by now it is conventional uh, in our, our track. And I asked uh, uh, for songs and um, I wasn't able to keep track of all of them. And uh, what I had to do was use the songs that I could find on Spotify. So, you know, that's a kind of a contradiction here. But I, I do want us to end with a song. And um, again, I'm very compelled by this question of what is your story, what is your origin story, and who gets to tell your story, you as an individual, and um, your origin story and your people's origin story. Who are your people? Yeah.